Okay, hold on a second here. You, me, right now. I want to point out and bring out to your attention right now that a gambling addiction is nothing to laugh about. It can destroy lives. It can be mentally, socially, and financially destructive. It could be too many pulls of the slots. It could be, could be too many deals of poker. It could even be just one too many loot crates unlocked at a luck of the draw on the online video game of your choice. But there is help for your friends, family, and you. For more information on this and other topics, go to www.gamesense.com or contact your local gambling jurisdiction for more local information on how to get help in the event that you feel that someone you know or yourself has a gambling addiction before it's too late. And remember, know your limit, play within it. For the last couple of videos, you probably noticed there's something over here that's reflective. There's something absolutely massive that's sitting over here in the corner. And this video is to explain exactly what the heck that is. Now I can't pull it over here and show you in front of the camera, so I'm gonna have to invite you as the viewer and the camera around to the other side of the table here, and I can better explain what I have set up. Normally, just out of shot from the camera is this little gaming nook that I've actually set up for myself. Now we've already gone over the pachinko machine once already in a previous video, but now we see it all in its glory with this beautiful 2x6 wooden frame to secure it to the wall, this lighting of directly above it, and yes, it does still work. Bummer. But this device here, we've already also talked about what's going on behind this door here. The real show stealer, and what we've been talking about so far, is this which has managed to blow its 9 volt AC fuse again. There we go. This is the Bally 742A electromechanical slot machine. Manufacturing of these cabinets here started in 1963. This unit here is fairly straightforward. We have one pay line, it takes nickels, and yes, it does have multiple coin insertions. And if you pull the handle, it sounds exactly as you'd expect from an electromechanical slot machine. When I mean simple, this thing is simple. There's no fruits, no bars, nothing. You have numbers, $2.50, $5, $10, $15, $25, $50, all the way up to $100. This machine will pay in coin payout of nickels only up to $25. Everything above that up to its maximum in jackpot, $300, is paid by the attendant. To make this machine a little bit more practical here in the house, I've actually raised it up a little bit. And there's a coin tray which, instead of it going into the base of the slot machine, it just falls into here. Then, when I go flat broke, I can just kind of pull the drawer out and dump the money back into the machine. So how did I get this machine? Well, as you might expect, it came from Craigslist. I've been looking for an electromechanical unit for a while there because Really, the computer ones, they're completely full of dragons. More so the modern ones, where there's all sorts of security, jurisdiction control, configurations, batteries, absolutely terrifying stuff. But if you go back too far, you're going to end up with the Mills and the Bells units. They're completely mechanical, no electronics inside them. They're very heavy, and they're also very desirable as a collector's item. They can sell for thousands of dollars. But a ballet cabinet like this one here, or a similar cabinet like this one here, those are not too much money. They can go between the range of $300 to $1,000. It really depends on the condition, the type of game theme that's installed on it, and the exact model and what options are. Some come with, for example, progressive jackpots. Others come with additional reels. It really comes down to that there and a little bit of good shopping. This one here was really not that expensive. It was $350 because it has a really boring game theme to it. We've already gone over it. It's just got these dull numbers. But this machine is very particular. Remember, electromechanical. Um, I had my usual little Craigslist like posting where it was a potato photograph and it wasn't anything desirable and the lights turned on but if you pulled the handle apparently the wheels didn't stop okay so it just needed some oiling that's not anything too bad so i went to go see the unit and this is what i saw it was turned on it looked fantastic it does have a little bit of wear on the sides a bit of roughage where some of the platings come off but other than that it looked okay on the outside 
And then he gave me the key, and we opened it, and then I discovered this while it was made in 1963, and there was a good 15 years before computerized control came into a slot machine, was not electromechanical. It is electronic. Microcontrol by Summit Systems Incorporated. Now, why the hell would you want to convert a slot machine over from electromechanical to digital or something like this? Well, there's two reasons there. The first one, going over digital means you can really knock out a whole bunch of common ways to cheat the system. You can't hold sensors, you can't hold switches, you can't even on the um, casino side, you can't rig the machine, so the reels will never stop on one spot or they'll always over advance on another spot. You can't do that. It's all indexed, monitored, and controlled. The system will tilt and disable itself. An example of how um, this anti-cheat measure is put into place is on the player side, there is the coin payout switch that's located down here on the hopper. It knows exactly how long it takes for a coin to pass through that switch the system knows how many coins it has to pay out, and it knows how many coins it's already paid out. One of the old tricks was to simply hold the switch in place and try and get a couple extra coins out without actually tripping out into the empty hopper scenario. It won't let you do that. It'll tilt the system. On the casino side, payout odd modifiers, or bugs as they were otherwise known, which were used to prevent reels from landing in winning locations, um, cannot operate because these wheels are in, reels are indexed. It'll play the game, it knows what each, uh, each slot reel is going to land on, it measures where it is when it indexes to fire the solenoids. After it's stopped, it checks again. If they're not in the right location, they will not accept that it's in a valid position. It'll tell you it's indexed too far or it's indexed um, too early. And for example here, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give it a coin, pull the handle, one, two, and I'm going to stop it here. Now, if I go backwards, the tilt light turned on. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to reset the unit. This reel is still spinning. These ones are locked. So it's going to now give me another play. I'll pull the handle. And I'll stop it again. Now, if I leave it like this, it will just hang, but I can turn the reel up oh, seat like right there it actually I timed out so it said there's a problem this reels not spinning so I reset it again but remember here it's 25 and 5 it's actually remember where it is it's not replaying the game if there's a tilt 25 5 and I'm going to slowly turn it and it's not engaging until there until it hit the 10 and that's because that was the position this reel was supposed to stop at if it was before or after, it would complain and it would tilt the system. The Summit upgrade that you're seeing here was an option I made available. Now, Summit, of course, had their own slot machine. This one here, however, quite simply, you purchased the kit. It came with a wiring harness, a bunch of components, some circuit boards, and you set out to the machine here, ripping out every electromechanical aspect of the machine and installing this. The, like, what you gained out of it was reliability. And I would have very easily noticed that this was even here because on the front of the machine we do have a little tiny display here. This LED display is not standard with an electromechanical. Remember, electromechanical, there'd be no way to drive an LED display on this thing at all. And in fact, in 1963, you wouldn't have an LED in the first place. Otherwise, the inside of this machine here is pretty straightforward. We have the real mechanism and logic control, which is right here. We'll pull this out and we'll take a look at it. At the very bottom here, you have the coin hopper. Again, this has been converted by Summit to control by the microcontroller. Down here is our only coin counter, and this is just simply to indicate either payout or coin in directly to here. I haven't had the time to double check to make sure what it was. On the door, on the other hand, it's just a couple of switches and the coin mech. Now, the coin mech on this thing is pretty peculiar because when I first got it, it came with a bunch of American coins. American nickels are special in that they understand that they can't really screw with the content and the composition of a coin too much, or vending machines will simply refuse to accept them. In Canada, however, this is not the case. At one point, we used to use nickel in our nickels, but for many years now, they've actually been an alloy or just steel slugs plated in nickel. As a result, if you put Canadian nickels into the machine right now, 
all it's going to do to you is they're going to stick to the magnet inside the coin rack and they're not actually going to work at all. The solution to this, however, is to take the magnet that is inside the coin mech, just pry that out. And now, basically anything that's the same relative size and shape as a nickel will work. Or in our case, Canadian nickels. Now, removal of the real mechanism is pretty straightforward on this machine. Here, let me show you, and then we'll put it on the table. So, pull these handles down, turn off the main power, and then pull straight towards you. Uh, watch out for the grease. Uh, all right, so this is the real assembly. This is the brains and the heart and the soul of the slot machine itself. Now, if you've watched the video from Big Clive regarding the real mechanism here, it's going to look very similar. And after I close this door here, um, Again, this is the electromechanical real mechanism, um, but converted. And there's a couple of things that have clearly changed on it. On the front of the unit here, first, the first thing we notice is that we do have this brand new plate here. And now we have this back plane and there's two boards in it. And I'm gonna unplug this battery pack, which I have installed on the side of the unit here. And the bottom board is our CPU. We'll talk about that in a moment. And the second board here, this is our interface and driver control board. Now let's take a look at these two boards here and uh, well, I'll better explain exactly what the heck we're looking at. Cause this is the heart and soul. Well, okay, this is the balls of the slot machine. So the CPU on this thing here is really not a whole hell of a lot in terms of what exactly it is. And this is it right here. This is the CPU control board. Summit Systems Assembly Number 150131. This, in reality, is the absolute bare basics for the Intel MCS48 family of microcontrollers. And we can clearly see the NEC version of that microcontroller is sitting right there. Now, thankfully, Summit Systems does not use a version of this chip with mask ROM inside of it. So when this machine is powered up, this is an absolutely stupid CPU. It needs the contents of this EEPROM to boot it up. And now there's no way to configure this machine as is once it's set up and installed. When you order the upgrade kit or you order a different game theme, you need to specify your pay tables, you need to specify your jackpots, you need to specify your progressives if those are supported. And that's all burned to this EEPROM along with the boot code. And that's what brings the system up initially. The other sort of portion of this board here is simply I.O., which is this chip over here. We'll get to that. But this also handles electronic metering. Remember, there's only one mechanical meter inside of the unit. The rest of it is stored inside of RAM, as well as the status of the current game tilt, if there is any, as well as the game state. One of the big things the battery also does in the event of a power failure is that it remembers exactly what the machine was doing. For example, if I put a coin in, the lever is now dropped down so I can pull the handle, it's free to go. But let's say the power fails. There we go. And I'll turn the unit back on and it's back ready to play again. It still considers that one coin has been put in and I can pull the handle and play my game. Now, what happens if you're playing your game and the power fails? Now, remember, we already know from the demonstration of the anti-cheat system that it, when you pull the handle, it already knows which each slot position is going to be. So it's really just the reels catching up to the computer. So we'll, again, we'll put in one coin, we'll pull the handle and have the power fail. See, power goes out. This reel is still spinning because the solenoid didn't engage. Lights are clearly off, like it's not going to do anything now, but we know $5 on this, or actually $15, $2.50, but what was the last one going to be? We don't know. Well, let's say you're sitting around in the machine and power comes back on. There we go. So the game is ready to go. It has dropped down the release uh, latch for the handle. Now remember, $15, $2.50, what is this last one here? 
$50. So it wasn't a winner, but it remembered exactly where it was. So you didn't have to put extra money in. It didn't take your money. Uh, very convenient if it's only a brief power outage. Newer slot machines, however, aren't as forgiving, and malfunctions can void all pays and plays. And that is why the, I did not want to get an electronic slot machine at all. Batteries are an absolute pain in the butt to work with. But I got a little lucky here. We'll get into that. But you can notice I've done something over here. Let me zoom in on that a little bit more and focus on that. There we go. You'll notice that there has been a little bit of screwery going on around here. Yes, this was the problem with the machine on why it didn't work when he had it and when I initially had it as well. Of course, after sitting for so long, the battery had uh, leaked and it caused an absolute goddamn mess. And there was a fair amount of troubleshooting that had to be done here. And if you're noticing that everything is in sockets here and some things are marked, that's because I put it into sockets. Everything on this board had to be stripped. I had to verify the value of everything there were a couple of components that had to be replaced, these three transistors right here. But that still didn't do it. The main issue is that you turn the machine on and it would fire off all of its little tiny um, solenoids. It would flash lights, but it wouldn't function right. Unless I either pulled out the CPU or the EEPROM. To me, that indicated that the I.O. chip and the drivers were being told to fire off because of something going on here. And the solution to that there, it wasn't rotted v traces. I did have a couple of traces which were clearly broken. But if we zoom in a little bit more, and I focus, something seems a little bit weird with these vias here. And that was my big problem. Um, the traces were at, like, from end to end, the traces were fine. But the connecting points from the vias to the traces was broken. So if I tested from the via to the trace, I found a break. But if I, I, for example, just tested here over to the pin, it was fine. So what I had to do here is I had to drill out a whole bunch of vias. There's about a dozen or there's about a dozen here and feed in a little tiny bit of wire wrap and then carefully solder it in on both sides of the board. And uh, I put the board back in and it worked. It worked. After that there, there is this nasty little red wire that popped up around here. What this is, is that I decided to move the original battery um, off of this completely. So now we have this two pin header here and I have, it's a 3.6 volt circuit. So I can put a cordless phone battery, which is a rechargeable nickel cadmium or, nickel, or, cadmium or nickel metal hydrate cell. And I have that on the side of the real assembly. If it leaks now, it's never going to be a problem to this at all. That's also to point out exactly that when this battery leaked, every, it sprayed off a very, very fine mist, and there was a light level of corrosion on everything in the machine. But anyways, enough talk of this. What the hell is this that makes me say that this is pretty much just a microcontroller? And yes, there is, or there was an attempt at one point to turn this into an Arduino-controlled slot machine by someone else. There's a thread somewhere else on the internet there. He got so far as to making it work with USB and then ran into weird DC coupling issues that would have clearly been fixed if he'd either put in proper buffering or opto isolation on the USB port. So this board here, it's not really easy for me to describe exactly what we're seeing here besides the last time this was serviced was June 22nd, 1981 by this person's hen scratch. But I've taken this, and because there's no schematics for this online, I have made this fancy little diagram. So what are we looking at here? Okay, here is our 2732 4 kilobyte UV EEPROM. 
The chip down in the corner here is a six digit binary control digit display, where is it? Bi BCD, I gotta double check on my acronyms there. Uh, display controller and driver. And the three transistors here are just the higher current drivers for that. That controls the three seven segment displays on the front of the slot machine. This chip here is your 32 word 8 bit static RAM. It's a very, very, very tiny amount of static RAM. Um, the battery originally in this unit would have last kept this alive for a week. Now that I'm on the cordless phone, it will keep the static RAM alive for a month without power. And there's a jumper over here, which if you remove, you can clear the contents or just unplug the battery now. Uh, directly above that is a three-state octal D-type latch, which is just some glue. But then down here, these components here are just um, decoders and drivers and high current Darlington drivers. These here will drive the solenoids. These also drive the relay and control board, which we'll look at next. And over here is your optocoupling and ILQ74 quad channel optocoupler. We have more glue up here, um, Schmidt triggers for the most part. And then we have these three chips up here. These are MC14512B8 channel data selectors. The spec sheets for them, or the data sheets for them, are really not all that interesting, except for one thing. They can be used for number generation. So I have a strange feeling, without looking at um, any detailed logic diagram of how the hell this system worked, or how this code performed um, the actual gameplay, but my bet is that this was being used as a random number generator which is a little bit interesting. And of course, down here we have our um, 8243C input-output expansion for the CPU itself. Now, when you play a game in this system here, one of the inputs that come in tell the CPU to play a slot game. And this is instantaneous. So when the reels are, so when you pull the handle, um, as the reels are released, the game's already done. Now it's just the mechanics catching up to the CPU itself. Pretty simple enough. And then there's a couple of configuration jumpers, which I've not yet entirely figured out what the heck they do. But either way, everything just runs through this double-sided edge connector here. There's more edge connectors on the other side here, but it's a two-layer PCB. It's very simple. Uh, in reality, comes when it comes to the battery damage, I didn't find any damage anywhere in this area here. There was a little bit here. Mainly it was under the EEPROM. But I only lost one resistor over here because I was stupid, and I replaced another diode over here because it seemed to be open in value. But that's just simply used, again, with the battery charging circuit. All right, so the other board that was in here as well is this. And let me zoom in on that. There we go. Uh, this is assembly number 15100, revision A. This is the driver and control board. Um, there's two versions of this that I've been told they're not entirely compatible. Uh, one version, version uses Triax. The other version, which is this one here, uses OFA1202 um, solid state relays. And this has been the most problematic board I've had. And in reality, it's really just a whole bunch of solid state relays. If we flip the other side over here, you can see that there's these big thick traces here which are handling both 120 volts AC, 9 volts AC, and some of the DC voltages to control a few other odds and ends. And over here, these little tiny thin wires, these are all the controls, uh, controlled outputs from the CPU board. But this has been problematic for me because these solid state relays are not manufactured anymore. And as we can see from the backside here, they are keyed in a peculiar way so that replacements have to fit in there. And when they go bad, and yes, they have gone bad, this actually one here controls the uh, tilt light, um, you really have to go and jury rig up your own replacement. And let's zoom in on this one here just so I can see, show you exactly what I've done. So this is a little tiny NAIS TQ2 5 volt relay. And it's simply sitting on top of a little piece of perf board which I've put four pins into, and it's just wired as a drop-in replacement for one of the solid-state relays. This here makes noise. Everything else here is absolutely silent. And that's a bit of a good thing. 
But, unfortunately, I'm not looking forward to having when more of these start to fail. I'm already having hopper issues, which I believe is one of these solid-state relays around in here. But we'll figure that one out when it comes to it. So, overall, um, given what this is doing, it's doing a very good job of being extremely serviceable while also being extremely modular. Every single component on here is off the shelf. Same goes with this here. A replacement relay wasn't too difficult to make for it, but there was the assumption that these would go bad far sooner, and, well, you could just desolder it and swap it out. So, really, that's negligible there. Uh, the two-layer PCB makes it still, again, very easy to service. Really, the only thing on this here that you could not otherwise just order off the shelf is the contents of the EEPROM. That I'm aware, there's only one uh, company that's still remaining right now, where if you fill out the pay table information and give the real and give like the real positions and all that, they will burn you a new chip. But it's over a hundred dollars. It's quite expensive. Still, two boards, very good job. Now, in comparison, I'm going to put these off to the side, and I'm going to show you a modern slot control board. This here is the Konami KP3 slot CPU board. Now, this is a video slot machine here. It's not like, say, the IGT S3000s, where they're still pseudo slots, but they're all stepper motor driven and really not what I'm after. But they're incredibly advanced. So, one CPU module here, two sticks of DDR3 RAM. Another CPU module here, another stick of DDR3 RAM hidden underneath the heatsink. We have an MXM card over here, which contains an ATI video card. We do have up here, there's a little board that sits on top of this compact flash slot, which allows you to load additional, I think, jurisdictional and BIOS ROMs. And with that compact flash part there, that one's marked Linux. On this side here, if we flipped it over, Windows can also be used to be booted from a compact flash as well. I'm not entirely sure how that works. But we also have networking. It has this ridiculously huge connector here. Again, in comparison to this, the density is at least five times as dense. But the biggest problem is that while the battery on these on the old slot machine, um, it's not really necessary. On this one here, these two CR2032s, if they go bad, the machine simply will not run. You will have to replace them with fresh batteries. You'll have to reconfigure it. It's not a fun thing to do. And believe me, I've had to do it before in my own time at work. And I'll just put those over there. And the other thing that's been added, remember the whole ca cabinet right now is running through that one AC transformer, but this is clearly a DC control device. Is This is a pa DC power supply, which sits in the end here. And it's nothing special. Again, um, this is pretty much just a linear power supply. Um, nothing special about it besides there's a couple of switches. This one here turns on and off the, uh, oh God, there's too much glare. Turns on and off the power supply. We have two other LEDs here. One indicates that power to all of the DC driven lamps is on. The other one indicates that DC is okay to the logic power itself, which is five and 12 volts. Below that, we have three buttons. One of them is hopper reset. That's simply if there's a hopper condition, like the hopper goes empty, you need to press that in order to resume payout once you've refilled the hopper. There's the hopper fill button, which is actually recessed here. And what that does is that it resets the counter for how many coins the slot computer expects inside of the hopper. And at the very bottom here is the master reset. That just resets the entire microcontroller and brings it back to it's whatever configuration it was in. If there was a tilt, it'll clear the tilt as well. Otherwise, if we go onto the side here, the first thing we notice is that usually this is where the stop clock stop mechanism for the electromechanical rear me real mechanisms would be. But that's all been removed. We can, however, see that there's the threaded points here and there's a spring stud here and a spring stud here where it's supposed to be. All of that has been replaced with this one micro switch right here. And quite simply, when the game plays, this switch is flicked, or I guess in this case here, this flick switch is actually released, and that there tells the microcontroller that it's ready to begin play if a credit has been inserted. Otherwise, nothing happens. And on 
the back of the unit here, we have the two mar massive set of connectors. I think, I, I can't remember off the top of my head what the connector type is called, but it's basically two pins here for alignment, but they can also be used as electrical contacts. And there's a whole bunch of these just flat pins. And we can see a little bit inside of the mechanism itself and hidden away directly behind these is also the solenoids that lock the reels. Now what gets the reels started? Well, this is the most untouched part of the slot, like of the electromechanical mechanism. Whoops, there we go. This is the most untouched part of the electromechanical mechanism and that is the actual launch system. This is the air piston which controls the return of the handle back. Usually this contains a little bit of rubber which goes bad and it gums up and it makes a complete mess. And what I've done is I've actually gone and taken that out and replaced it with a very heavy grease. Otherwise, what happens here is that this little arm here is what, is what is pulled to begin the actual spinning. And if I'm gonna try and spin this right now, so I think the better idea is just to go like this and not crunch my fingers. Ugh, nope, you gotta go like this. It's, it's, it's a really hard spring. There we go. So now the reels are spinning and we can see they got a nice uniform spin to them. That's pretty good. The needle bearings on these are not that bad. Although this one's slowing down. Oh well, by now the game would have stopped. But you can see inside here, there's a bunch of spokes and you might even see the lights passing through. You can see the printer a little bit behind here in some of these spots as it passes through in some spots. And what you're seeing is the first part of the conversion from electromechanical to electronic. And I'm going to, there's two clips here, so I'm gonna push those down. And then Big Clive couldn't do this because he only had one hand because he was holding the camera on the other. I'll use my thumbs to simply roll the real mechanism out of place. I'm just gonna put that off to the side for now. And inside of the real mechanism, so these are the three launchers right here. And normally there's a set of frames that go back here and this would contain your relays, a large number of electronic electrical contacts. All of that has been removed out of the elect, into the electronic design. In its place, however, we have these printed circuit boards right here. And these actually contain a set of uh, resistors. This is very greasy, I'd like to point out. Like, this is disgusting. Um, it's also making a hell of a mess of my table right now. But uh, these contain phototransistors. And what those phototransistors are doing, I'm gonna move that over there, is that the conversion on these slot reels is that, the glare here will do better, we have these windows. Some of them are larger, some of them are smaller, some of them are at the low side, some of them are at the high side, but they're in a particular order. And this is how the microcontroller is able to track exactly what position each reel is in. It's no longer a case of these spokes here being of different depths for it to just kind of lock into and determine electronically um, if it's a winner or not. It's now all computer controlled. And there's one piece here, which is basically like the default timing point when you have to adjust and set up the unit here. But other than that, it simplified the design here quite a bit. Now, of course it can still wear out, but I've greased it and it's disgusting. And all three of these are exactly the same. And let me see if I can get this back over here again. Ugh. So there's, two actual components to these arms here. Uh, this here, what you're looking at is the actual stop arm. The one down here, however, is used for the actual flicking. Underneath the unit, however, instead of our clock mechanism, which is being used to fire off or to lock each reel, there's a set of three solenoids which are used instead. And if I actually put that in or push this in, it'll actually engage it. Let's see that from the other angle here. So I'm going to push the middle one in, this one here, and that's gonna put it into place. Third one, I'm gonna push that one in, and that'll put that into place. And these arms here are spring-loaded because the idea is that it may be a, be a little bit, no, it's not. Anyways, it may be, 
these arms here simply, when they fly into the wheel, the wheel's still got a bit of momentum. So it's actually going to grab into there. The spring's going to pull it up a bit to kind of like catch the energy of the rotation. And then it's going to pull it back to its default position. That is this when, when these um, photo gates are going to again sample exactly what position the reel is in for indexing. And this is where anti-bug tampering or anti-bug um, detection comes into play because it has to be where it expects it to be, otherwise the machine will tilt. Uh, otherwise, there really isn't much else that's been added to this. Um, we see the card cage down here, and really this whole front piece here is just the card cage. The rest of it is just the wiring harness that plugs into the back. But there is no logic in this thing at all. So let's take a moment to try and put these reels back on because they can be quite annoying. There we go. One, two, three. And they're keyed. So they only fit in one position. There's a flat spot on this. And this may be a bit more convenient if I, re if I spin them again. So, uh, yep, yeah, okay. Didn't like that at all. Nope, okay. Nope, I've done this right. All right. So now they're free spinning. And I'm going to play those solenoids again. Oh, I'm not going to get the last one. Oh, too bad. Oh, there it is. Okay. And we can see that stopping from this side over here. Think we can do that? Eh, we can see you in the glare. Keep an eye on this arm right here. So I'm going to launch it again. Spinning. Going to fire off the re solenoid. <clears throat> there. And you saw it just kind of flick up like that, but it's always going to lock back into place here for the sake of alignment on the photo gates. And that makes up the incredibly greasy and incredibly disgusting. Here, let me latch those last two solenoids. There we go. Um, real assembly. I'm just going to throw everything back in here. This is thankfully easy enough. Pushes that right back in. The control, the driver board right here. There we go. And the CPU board with my battery here. And I have marked which way is positive. And then I can safely slide that back in there and attach the Velcro back over here. But there's another arrow over here. What the heck is this? There's another spot down here for something else. There's an option board you can get for these. Um, many slot machines don't have it, some do. And this is simply allowing for uh, networked progressive jackpots between multiple machines or for feedback back to a central computer, which can enable or disable machines. It can count uh, how active they are, monitor the meters, and so forth. I believe one option for that is uh, current loop. But anyways, let's put this one back in the machine. <clears throat> Put that back in there. Nice and solid into those back connectors. All right, let's look at the coin hopper now. Ugh. Full of money. All right, so this is the coin hopper. This that I can tell hasn't changed a whole heck of a lot. You're looking at the back side here, and this is the non-direct motor drive. So it's actually a geared unit over here from an AC motor that goes to another gearbox. And we have a couple of odds and ends that are going on here. This is a component. This board here is part of the Summit System retrofit. I actually do believe this is um, the original hopper, but it is retrofitted again. And we have two other things that are going on here. Uh, the first is, let me see if I can get a good angle of this here. There we go. So the first is this micro switch right here. And what that controls is from the top down, you can see is that it goes to a roller switch on the top here. We'll get back to that in a little bit here. The other is this um, solenoid right here. And as you can see, it operates this sort of cutoff blade that's inside of the unit. And if I flip the unit around here, we can see the actual hopper mechanism itself. This is where coins re-enter 
into the hopper via a mechanism inside the door of the slot machine. But otherwise, what you have is the motor on this side here. Really nothing all that special besides this gearing here. It is on a spring. I'm assuming this is just so it to help to deal with jams. So it doesn't actually have a fixed mounting point inside of the machine, but there really is no overflow. It's completely up to the slot controller to make sure that there's enough coins in here that it won't run out, but at the same time, it's never gonna overfill because it really doesn't have a way to dump coins into the bin below the machine. But this motor rotates inside, and let me see if I can try and turn this. There's this um, pegged wheel in here that rotates as well. It's really difficult to turn this. There we go. And if I struggle to turn this, you can see coins trying to go through, but they keep on falling down. That's what this blade assembly here is. This is controlled by a secondary loop inside of the payout mechanism. In fact, the motor inside this unit and this solenoid are linked, but it takes two individual circuits for this to operate at all. This is a fail safe in case one gets stuck open. It means that the slot machine's not gonna start dumping money out when it's broken and someone's gonna make an absolute killing. So the motor runs, the solenoid goes in, and this rotates, and this is really difficult to do with one hand. And the coins go through, and that little switch in the corner there, which I'm currently up against, as it drops coins out of it, it's hitting that switch. And that's counting the coins back on the microcontroller. Now, back in the day, I've mentioned this once already, um, you could hold this up and you could basically just before it times out and thinks the hopper's empty, you could just kind of like dump out coins out of the unit and it wouldn't recognize that. The microcontroller, again, is able to detect if you've held it for too long because, well, a coin's only so big and it expects the coin to be that big. So you can't screw with that anymore. Otherwise, the hopper is a very boring device. It does have the connector on the other side here and this plugs into the bottom unit and just directly behind this inside the slot cabinet is all the um, AC power control and all of that. But otherwise it lives its life typically not breaking down all that much. It will jam from time to time but the idea is that you do regularly keep it oiled. But that is the hopper itself. So let's put this back in the machine now. <sighs> All right, so what's the history of this machine here as well? Well, when I got the machine, I was told that this came out of the Desert Sands Hotel, um, Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas. But it's pretty obvious to see here, this came out of the Mitzpah Hotel in Tonopa, Nevada. This hotel um, opened in the early 20th century and then closed in 1999. It then reopened in 2011, and now there's the plans to actually add a casino into it. So where the heck was this thing for the last couple of years? Was this thing pulled out during the closure and just made its way back up to Canada? The story I've been told is that this unit here has been in storage for the last 30 years. So that means it has to have existed in the, slot, in the casino or in the hotel itself since before the first time it closed. And the service card inside of this, I'd like to point out, has not been changed since 1982. That's the last time this thing has been seen any kind of repair. Further cementing that this thing came from a different time at the Mitzpah Hotel, jammed into the hinge of the door was a book of cigarettes, or not a book of cigarettes, a book of matches. That's it. That's proof. This is definitely a relic out of the Mitzvah Hotel. That's really cool. Okay, so now we've seen inside of the slot machine. We've seen, well, we've seen exactly the real mechanism. We've seen the hopper. We've seen the circuit boards that make the slot machine actually do its job. But we haven't seen inside the door, and we definitely have not seen inside the rest of the cabinet once everything's pulled out. So... Let's open the door again and take a look inside. So inside the slot machine with the real assembly and the um, hopper removed, it's really quite barren, but there's still a couple fancy odds and ends that I do want to talk about while we're in here. 
So let's take a look in the lower corner here and uh, see exactly what the heck's going on. So located down here in the corner, we do have the one mechanical timer that is inside the unit. Uh, this either counts on coin jackpot payout or coins that go into this chute here, which usually go into the bay underneath here, but goes into my nice little tray. This here is the main power switch, as well as we have two circuit breakers, breakers that are hiding over here. My main problem one right now is the 9 volt AC at the very top. This drives all of the small incandescent bulbs that are used for attraction, as well as the giant display board at the very top of the unit. Located behind that, we see the connector here for the hopper, as well as our AC line filter, a couple of mysterious connectors and terminals over here, which aren't listed in the schematics, and we have our transformer here, which converts our 120 volts down to the AC voltages that the rest of the machine uses. Going a little further up on the machine here is the actual mechanical reel mechanism. This is original to the cabinet, so this would have been here during the electrical mechanical days. If you've seen Big Clive's video on electromechanical slot machines, um, you'll see this. And he basically describes that, yeah, there's a solenoid up here. If you hit that, this then unlocks the handle. So I can pull the handle down, but now it's locked in the lower position here, and this little arm here has gone up. That's because the reel assembly has to reset the arm. So if I press this down, it flings back into place. Now it shouldn't go back so violently. There is an air cylinder on this reel assembly that takes care of this all. This harness that's hidden way the heck at the back here, as well as these two connectors, are the connections that actually go to the reel assembly and the slot controller itself. Normally this would also be the input and output to the electromechanical unit, but there's been a complete harness replacement here. What isn't new to the machine, or what is new to the machine actually, is this connector up here. I had to add that so that you could actually remove the door out of the system. This connector comes out, a couple of clips here come out, these screws come out, that disconnects, which connects to the bell ringer on the very top, as well as the candle signals and the door sensor, and then the whole door assembly can come out of the unit. Speaking of the door unit, uh, let's start with the hinge here. Now, we already know that the book of matches came out of this thing. I'm assuming it was for the switch that's hiding behind it. This is a dual purpose switch. One is an input for the slot controller, so things don't operate when the door is open. The other is a switch to indicate on the candle that the door is currently open. And this is just sim simply so an attendant at a glance can see if the machine's been currently open or not. Think of it like a tamper mechanism. This here is the back side of the window to which you see the reels through. Now, the shielding right here is actually part of the lighting. On the bottom and on both sides here, we have little incandescent bulbs. These are all run by the 9-volt circuit. I'm fairly certain what's the, uh, the reason is for that uh, circuit breaker constantly popping is because these are the wrong bulbs. That's got to be the only thing I can think of. There's nothing else in here that could overload it that badly. But at the very top here, we do have a fluorescent lamp. And the fluorescent lamp is controlled by a ballast and starter that's directly below us. Here they are. So it's quite obvious here. You can see one starter, two starters, and there's a third starter down here, as well as these small ballasts. One of these ballasts here control the fluorescent light that we saw earlier. However, the belly of the front door also contains two fluorescent tubes. And that's what lights up, lights up the mitzpah sign on this unit here. In the middle, we have our coin mechanism. This one here is currently set up for five cents. And as you've seen, I've already taken the magnet out of it. So really any coin of similar weight and size will work. Below that, we have the one switch here, which indicates coin insertion. There's another switch hidden down here, which also verifies that a coin itself has actually gone into the tray underneath the machine. There's this little knife assembly up here, which is solenoid driven. The level of the hopper is monitored, not by a sensor, but simply by coin counting. When you start off from scratch, it assumes a certain number of coins are in it. As coins are taken out via winning, this little knife here will go in like that. And now coins will no longer go down and into the machine. They'll actually redivert back into the hopper and it'll count how many coins go into it, and then once it's happy with how many are in the hopper again, it'll go backwards, and then it'll pay back down into the bottom of the unit. Now the very top of the unit is not by any means a static display. 
Now it does tell you what the win out payout odds are for your first, your second, or your third coin. But when you turn the machine on and everything initializes, it'll also show the last coin that was inserted. So we had three coins inserted last time, which gave you your minimum winning of $7.50 to your maximum winning of $300 if you hit $100 on the center lines. If I insert a coin, that's gonna reset it back to the first coin. If I add another coin, that's gonna bring it to the second coin. And again, if I go back to adding the third coin, that's gonna go and bring it all the way to the very top. Now, when you insert your third coin, it'll actually lock out the coin mechanism in this machine. So you cannot add more coins. You put your three in, anything else you add is just gonna be rejected back into the bin. All you can do now is pull the handle. Now, if I were to release the glass on this, you can see that what you're looking at for every number here is actually an individual incandescent light on each. Here, let me turn that off like that. And each of these incandescent lights, they're addressable by row here, but these ones here are static on the top and bottom. Again, this is part of the nine volt circuit. There's also two catch uh, latches at the very top of the unit. And if I open that, and I move the camera up a little bit, we can just see inside here that this is the back side of that light panel. There's the triac driver controls for the lights. That connector there, or that connector there, is supposed to be for the candle. And of course, there is our good old jackpot bell. Okay, and we'll close her up, and we'll latch the key, and there we have it. There's the answer to what the heck is going on right beside me here. It's an electronic slot machine. Am I happy that it's an electronic machine and not the electromechanical I was really gambling, ah, uh, pun, sorry, I was really hoping to get my hands on? Well, it's a great conversational piece. And if you look up Summit slot machines that have been converted from Bally's, there's really nothing out there. And there's even fewer people out there who want to admit they own a Summit auto slot system that actually works. So I'm quite proud of the amount of work I put into this to get it completely working. I can put coins in, pull the handle, and it'll play exactly like a slot machine. Although I have noticed, I'm not sure if it's been programmed into me miserable, or maybe there's something a little bit more fishy going on underneath. But the payout odds on this thing are absolutely miserable. I can dump an entire tray's worth of nickels into it, and it won't pay me back even $2.50. Oh well, it's called the one arm Bandit for a reason. But I have the ability to get my money back whenever the heck I want. And, well, unfortunately, I can't put a candle onto this dang thing because it currently stands about two inches shorter than the actual ceiling of this room. And even if I did have the candle, and in fact I do have a candle right here, but it's not the proper sized unit, the wiring diagrams are a little inconsistent. And, well, service uh, documentation for this unit on its own were difficult. I had two websites that were trying to sell me it from anywhere between $35 to $50. And then there was another website, this is shiny, stop it. I had another website that was basically saying, go to this link and you can download it. And that's where I got it. But I have a feeling that they don't really want that kind of word to get out exactly where it is. So I'm gonna hold back on that link. You can just Google it and you probably will find it. It's kind of a shame that, well, the only other person who will service auto slot stuff wants so much money for spare parts and components. But, well, what do you gotta live with? As long as you grease the machine and take care of its electronic components, I really think this will last a heck of a lot longer than one of the much newer electronics, say a Bally, or not a Bally, an IGT S2000 slot machine, which a lot of people seem to have, or, well, it's gonna eventually hold up on the value, like say a Mills or a Bell's unit. It won't get as much money as one of those older fully mechanical units, but it's still just absolutely fantastic that it has a history behind this machine. The Mitzvah Hotel, like go, go Google image search Tonopa, Nevada right now. It's a totally like, it's a desert town. Um, the hotel is one of the most prominent things in the town. And there's a bit of history behind that as well. And I'm glad to have this here in my rec room slash YouTube video room for me to enjoy next to my pachinko machine. And I really hope you enjoyed the look around and the tour of all the components, the insides and the outside of the slot machine. 
And I strongly suggest that uh, if you want to be a little bit savvy, try and find yourself your own electromechanical slot machine. Um, being aware at the exact same time, there are some jurisdictions that do not allow private ownership of slot machines. So I do recommend a little bit of research in that regard. I seem to recall Australia especially does not allow private units. But someone correct me if wrong. But until next time, have a good one.